Uh, hi everybody, uh, this is uh, screencast number two for chapter 16 and I am also on puppy duty here so I'm trying to keep my eye on our new little puppy over there. Okay, but we're going to talk about the structure of DNA. So this is the stuff from the study guide and I'm just going to go uh, along following the study guide to try to help you keep track of where we are. So the first part is just what information was used to figure out the structure and then how the atoms are arranged uh, and so forth. So we'll just do this real quick. Uh, okay, so here's Watson and Crick. Okay, they are credited with discovering the structure. Uh, that always makes me a little bit annoyed because Rosalind Franklin was a huge part of this. Um, and of course, they didn't get the no they all got the Nobel Prize, but she didn't get it until after she had passed away. Uh, so anyway, that's a thing. Uh, Watson is still alive. He's really controversial these days. He's made some comments about race, which have put him on the forefront of uh, some interesting uh, critiques. And Crick has passed away. Uh, here's a really good TED Talk if you want to listen to it. Um, super interesting, you know, when you have time. All right, and this is a review. Okay. Uh, do you remember? what class of macromolecules DNA is in, what are the monomers, what are the components of DNA. Okay, sorry, I got relieved of puppy duty, so I went into the other room, okay. Um, all right, anyway, so this is a quick review. Uh, here is um, what DNA looks like, and we'll go into all these details here as we go along. But down here in this box is a nucleotide, okay, and these are the things that we're going to talk about. All right, so the information that was used to figure out the structure, the first one is called Chargraff's Rules, and that is something that was observed when they were figuring all this out. If you look at this table with all these different species, uh, they observed that the percentage of A is always almost the same as the percentage of T. So these are the bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And we'll get to that again in a second. You probably, I mean, I'm sure you have, A, T, C, and G. Uh, this rule just says that A and T are always present in almost exactly equal amounts, and G and C are present in equal amounts. And that is true, you know, through all these species. So that was an interesting observation that helped them figure out the structure. Um, they also used X-ray diffraction. This is where Rosalind Franklin came in. I read something or heard something that she had done this X-ray crystallography picture of DNA, which was the key observation for figuring out the uh, double helix structure of it. And uh, what I heard was that they took it off her desk. Um, I'm not sure that's true or not true, but anyway, uh, she's the one that was doing that X-ray work and they were using that to figure out the structure. So X-ray diffraction was a super good tool um, you shoot x-rays through a crystallized piece of protein or nucleic acid, and it puts an image on a piece of x-ray paper, and you can sort of get the shape. Uh, and then they used a lot of models. Okay, so they had to make lots of different models to try to find one that would accommodate their data, right? You can't change your data to fit your model, but you can adjust your model to fit your data. All right, and then here again is a little, we'll go through all the detail of how these atoms are arranged. Okay, there's some key components. The first one is a sugar group. Okay, it's called deoxyribose. Ribose is a five carbon sugar. That's this five carbon thing right there in blue. And every single nucleic acid has that same sugar. So that's a monosaccharide and it's called deoxy because it's missing an oxygen at one of these key carbons, okay? And then there's phosphate groups, okay? So that's this thing circled in yellow. And then there's the nitrogenous bases. So that's this part. Here's a base, here's a base, here's a base, here's a base. So these are the four bases present in DNA, guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine, all right? So DNA has those three things, the sugar, the phosphate, and the base, all right? Uh, purines are the adenine and guanine. So here's adenine. It's got two rings, lots of nitrogens, which is why they're called nitrogenous. And guanine has two rings. So guanine and adenine are the purines. And then cytosine, 
He's got one ring here and thymine has one ring. Okay, and so those are the pyrimidines. All right, one little trick to remember that is that thymine and cytosine both contain the letter Y and pyrimidine has the letter Y. So if you're trying to remember which ones are pyrimidines and which ones are purines, you can try to use that little trick, okay? Um, but those are the four bases. Uh, when we get to RNA, you'll see there's one that's different, but guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine, and then the sugar and the phosphates. Okay, so the backbone is composed of the sugar and phosphate group. So here's a phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. So that's called the backbone because it sticks out on the outside when this thing turns into a double helix. And they are linked through these covalent bonds between a carbon on the sugar and an oxygen on the phosphate. So there's a line right there. That's a covalent bond. Covalent bond, covalent bond. So they're held together pretty tightly. Covalent bonds are pretty strong. They're not as strong as ionic bonds, but you know it's an actual sharing of electrons to make an actual bond. Okay, so that's a pretty strong bond holding that sugar phosphate backbone uh, together. Okay, and then on the inside are the bases. So the rungs, if you think of it like a ladder, uh, the rungs of the ladder are composed of the bases. So this strand, this base is sticking into the middle, and it pairs up with this base on the other strand. Okay, it's a two-stranded molecule. All right, and those are only held together by hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds, you may recall, are not actually bonds. Okay, it's a bad name. All right, they're an intermolecular force of attraction between, in this case, an H on one base and an O on the other base. Actually, Yes, that's correct. No, actually, it's probably nitrogen. Nitrogen and hydrogen, because those are nitrogenous bases. Okay, so that is the middle part of this structure, are the rungs, okay, which is the base pairing. All right, um, this is an interesting bit of uh, Mr. Sanger humor, which we'll get to in a second here. But the base pairing, um, A is always going to base pair with T. So you always will have one uh, purine with one pyrimidine, and guanine will always pair with cytosine. So A will pair with T, and G will pair with C. And you can see these hydrogen bonds. Okay, so actually this one is an OH hydrogen bond, and this one is an NH hydrogen bond. Uh, you probably remember hydrogen bonding is between uh, F and H, O and H or N and H. So this is a hydrogen bond and this is a hydrogen bond. Um, the guanine and cytosine have three hydrogen bonds between them. The dotted lines, here's one, here's one, here's one. Okay, so probably you might, you know, guess that the GC hydrogen bonding is going to be stronger than the AT hydrogen bonding. Okay, and I decided to make that obvious by making George Clooney's picture bigger than Tim Allen's picture. Okay, George Clooney is, uh, you know, pretty cute. Tim Allen, he's okay too. Um, but anyway, so A and T are going to base pair with two hydrogen bonds, and G and C are going to base pair with three hydrogen bonds. All right, um, and there's always going to be um, a pyrimidine with a purine. And this is something they figured out from looking at their model. They finally, I shouldn't say finally, but when they did it like this, they could see that the width was um, consistent down the whole length of the double helix, which is consistent with what they saw on their x-ray data. When they tried to make a model, you know, with a pyrimidine or a pyrimidine base paired together, or a purine and a purine, those didn't fit. You know, it didn't fit their actual observations. So they had to adjust. So they adjusted their model and realized that you're always going to have it purine with a pyrimidine to keep that width, whoops, sorry, uh, consistent. All right, so um, the other important thing is directionality, okay? These two strands are said to be anti-parallel, okay? So for example, if you look at this middle part right here, we have this strand on this side, the other strand is on this side, uh, here's our phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar. So here's our backbone, our phosphate, sugar backbone on this one. And this end with the phosphate group on it is called the five prime end. 
This is really important and I will try to draw it out for you. Okay. Um, the other end has this OH group on this carbon. Okay. And so this free OH group on this three prime end is really important where another nucleotide could join. So when we start getting into that, I will draw that out and show you. But on this left hand strand, this five prime end is up here and the three prime end is down there. But on the other strand, it's flipped over. Okay, so on the bottom, we have a five prime end with a free phosphate group, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar. And then up here, we have this free OH group on that sugar, which is the three prime end. So that's what we mean when we say it's anti-parallel. This left-hand strand is going five prime down to three prime. The right-hand strand is going from five prime on the bottom up to the three prime end on the top. Okay, and this is really important when we start talking about DNA replication. And it also is like this because it has to keep the width constant of the two strands. Okay, so um, that is what we mean when we say directionality. One strand goes five prime to three prime. The other strand goes three prime to five prime. Okay, so here's another picture of a nucleotide. Okay, so here's this OH group down here, and here's the phosphate group. Um, and I think that's what I just said. Okay, all right. Now, if you were going to add a new base to the end of here with this OH group, Okay, the kind of reaction, do you remember the kind of reaction type that's used to take monomers and hook them together to make a polymer? Okay, I'm hoping in your brain you're thinking of the word condensation or dehydration synthesis. Okay, so this OH group right here, which is on the three prime end, is required to do that condensation reaction because if you're talking about condensation, I generally call it dehydration synthesis. You need to have a water that gets removed. So this OH is gonna be part of that reaction, gets removed and a new bond is formed. Okay, so that would happen right down here on this three prime end, okay? You would add another base here to the three prime end, or you could add another base here to this three prime end. Okay, and again, when we start talking about replication and how the strands become elongated, we'll talk about that again. All right, uh, this is super important. Um, the structure of DNA is the same in every single thing, okay? And it's the sequence of bases that varies. And I don't know if you heard this, but you know, they've added a cabinet level position for science to the cabinet with this new administration. Today is the day after the inauguration, in case you're wondering, it's January 21st. And President Biden has announced that there will be a science cabinet member, and the person they've named is the guy that headed up the human genome project with sequence, the entire sequence of the human genome. So that is pretty cool. All right, I'm gonna stop right there.